Hi there, and a warm welcome to all of you today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your lives to join us. Um, it gives me so much energy to see uh, the geographies pop up in the chat. Um, hello from Nigeria, from Los Angeles, from Caracas. Um, really at this moment when we are all so separate uh, in our homes, um, and the world in some ways seems to be uh, uh, at such a challenging moment of disconnection, to be connecting here in this way is so powerful. So thank you so much for joining Girl Rising and the Story Center for a discussion on, I think, three most important things in life, listening, learning, and telling stories. Um, my name is Holly Gordon, and I am the co-founder and board chair of Girl Rising, which is a global nonprofit that uses the power of storytelling to change the way the world values girls and their education. As some of you may know, Girl Rising started with a film. We started um, with a film that tells the stories of nine girls from countries all around the world and their struggles to overcome barriers to their education. And we now use that film and a full story-centered curriculum to engage with community leaders in dozens of countries. And our goal is to change mindsets and shift limiting beliefs about the value of the girl in the eyes of her family, her community, and her nation so that girls are able to complete their secondary education at the same rate as boys. I don't think many of you on this call would be asking why girls, but for those of you who do wonder about our focus, we know that educating uh, girls is like a silver bullet when it comes to global development. When you invest in educating girls, you break cycles of poverty, you improve health outcomes, and you're better able to protect our planet from degradation. Sometimes I try to imagine what would have happened if Greta hadn't gone to school. And we're here because we at Girl Rising believe uh, in the power of storytelling, just like the Story Center. Stories are like magic because they can invisibly go into a human being and change a heart and a mind and ultimately shift the ways that laws are written and investments are made. Because when you change many hearts and many minds, you create a demand for a new normal. So our mission at Girl Rising is to tell more stories that celebrate girls' leadership and girls' education in more places and in new ways so that more parents and more prime ministers and more presidents all around the world can see the value of investing in our girls equally. So we are so excited to partner with the storyteller, uh, the Story Center, and hope that each one of you will contribute a story to the storytelling challenge that you are going to hear more about today. Because your stories are powerful fuel for change. So thanks again for joining us. And I'm now going to throw it over to Judith, the amazing Vice President of Programs at Girl Rising to say a few words. Hello, everyone. My name is Judith Regis. I am the Vice President of Programs here at Girl Rising. I have the joy of leading Girl Rising's programs in 11 countries. I'm delighted to welcome you all here today alongside the incredible young people from our task force, Vicky Muti and Aria Young. We are thrilled to have you all join us on this webinar on the power of your voice and the power of your stories. This is a subject of particular importance for me because I believe stories shape who we are and who we are becoming, individually and collectively. At a time when we are living through a global pandemic, and the reckoning around race injustice, a time when thousands of millions of young people are impacted by school closures, a time when the gain we've made in education and gender parity are at risk of becoming undone. 
this is a critical time for us. A time when each and every single one of us are making choices in how we are responding to this moment in time, demonstrating courage, resilience, generosity, and above all, a spirit of community. These stories, your stories, need to be shared with the world. This is why Go Rising has partnered with HP to bring your voice and your stories in shaping and redesigning a new future. I would like to welcome Vicky Muti, members of the Go Rising Young Leaders Task Force, to tell you a little bit more about the challenge. Vicky? Hello, everyone. My name is Victoria Muti, and I am a member of Go Rising's Young Leaders Task Force. Through my story, the Girl Rising Storytelling Challenge, we are collecting stories of groups or individuals from around the world who are supporting their communities and responding to these times. We want to highlight the important work you and people around you are doing to create a better place. So whether you are a teenager in Texas organizing conversations between police or local students, or a group of educators in Guatemala delivering learning materials to girls in rural areas, or a group of young women in Nairobi distributing health and menstrual hygiene supplies, we want to hear your inspiring stories. You can submit your stories in audio, narrative, video, or digital image form until September 1 on our website, girlrising.org. A panel of judges will be identifying 15 showcase stories that will be included on Girl Rising's International Day of the Girl Celebration on October 9th. Also, the winners will be awarded a $500 microgrant. Hi, my name is Aria Young, and I'm also a member of the Girl Rising Young Leaders Task Force. We hope that many of you will submit your stories to the Storytelling Challenge, and we hope that this webinar will help you find your creative ideas and share your voice. Keep in mind that this is an interactive webinar, so we will be asking you to share responses and ideas in the chat throughout our time together. We'll, we'll also have time for questions and answers towards the end, so please submit your questions in the chat as well. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you, Aria. And a huge thanks to our partners at HP for making these micro grants possible. And now I would like to welcome the incredible Allison Myers of the Story Center, who's going to lead us into an interactive conversation on the tools and strategies in developing your voice in the creative process of telling your stories. Now we hope in sharing these tools and strategies with you, you'll be inspired to not only share your stories, but you will also inspire others to do the same. Allison, over to you. First, I'd like to start with a story. Um, so several years ago, I facilitated a workshop in Northern Kenya. Um, and for a week, my colleague and I, and we were both white Western women, sat with leaders from eight different indigenous tribes. Um, there were men, there were women, there were evangelical Christians, there were deeply conservative Muslims, there were Catholics and African spiritualists at the table. Some of the people at the table were fishermen, some were hunter-gatherers, and some were pastoralists. And some were historical enemies who raided each other's cattle and goats. We worked in 10 different languages that week. And the people in the room didn't normally sit at the same table and normally talk with each other, much less listen to each other. But for five days, um, we worked together, we ate together, we laughed, we cried. Uh, we struggled with new technology, uh, we listened to each other's stories, and they were stories of pain, stories of triumphs, um, aha moments, concerns about the future, their children, um, concerns about the land and the loss of culture and tradition. And each day my colleague and I invited someone from one of the different tribes or spiritual traditions, a man or a woman, to open or close the day, uh, with either a prayer or a story, a ceremony, a tradition, something that they wanted to share with the group and what, you know, whatever they wished. And we not only listened, but we all actively participated as we were invited. Um, but on the evening, um, the day, the day before, the evening before the last day, um, Al-Shabaab attacked the only university that's in that region in Northern Kenya. 
and it was about it was probably about 150 kilometers away from where we were in Isiola. Um, Isiolo. Uh, we learned that later that about 150 young people, university students, had been killed at Garissa University. And everyone in the room knew somebody there, or a, you know, a kinsman, a friend of a friend's child um, who was killed. And as we sat there, just stunned, you know, just it was a really somber moment. And the most stubborn man in the group who you know, had something to say about everything, was a little bit challenging, very difficult to please in many ways. But he stood up and he said to the group, I wish this week of listening and sharing stories would never end. From this experience, I know something now that I didn't know before. And that is if more people like us, this group here, sat at a table like this, and listen to each other all the way in, all the way in, as we've done this week. Things like this, like what happened at Garissa, would not happen. I believe this with all of my heart, he said, and then sat down. And I believe this as well, which is why I do the work that I do with such passion. Um, so, so my name again is Allison Myers and I work for an organization uh, called Story Center. And for the last 14, 15 years, I've had this the wonderful pinch myself every day, um, but I can't believe I get to do this job of traveling around the world and listening to people's stories, all kinds of people, all kinds of groups and helping people learn how to share their stories in impactful, meaningful ways that bring about healing, that cultivate community, that serve to, to advocate for better laws, for, um, you know, to address stigma, to advocate for justice, to create understanding and empathy. And so I like to call myself uh, like a midwife of stories, more or less. Um, so, so Story Center is a nonprofit. It's based in California in the USA, and we've been around for about 30 years. Um, we work with all kinds of nonprofits, government agencies, health and human services, universities, educators, you know, many organizations like the ones that probably many of you here today represent. Um, so I'll just tell you a quick story about how we got started so that you can understand um, just the foundation of the work we do, our ethics and the values and why we do the work that we do, why we think story is important. So my boss, um, who is the founding director of Story Center, grew up um, with parents who were labor organizers and really involved in civil rights work. And um, so he grew up with a social justice background. And um, he started, he did a lot of community work, community development and all of that. And so he also studied theater. So he had a theater in Berkeley for many years. And one of his colleagues, um, who that, that together they created this one man uh, show that traveled around the USA. And um, Dana, Joe's colleague, had saved all of his photographs and video, you know, from his whole life and it was organized, which most people don't have. Now it's all on our phones and, and you know, our Google drives and Facebook and all of that. But um, he added all in boxes and it was really organized. And so this was right when the first personal computers came out and most normal people like most of us who aren't um, documentary filmmakers or who aren't, don't work for big media houses, um, uh, were not making media. So um, we were, and we still are consumers of media. And so um, at this point in time, this was like 92 ish, um, the pretty much the first personal computer started to come out. And so they took all of that material and they created these little short video pieces, you know, two, three minutes. And Dana sat on a stage on a log at a, with a fake fire with all these icons. And then he would click and play, you know, play the video clips that they'd made and then live narrate these short uh, personal stories, first person stories from his life. And people responded like amazingly to the to this this show. Um, because normally I don't know 
well, I think this is probably true for most of us, but when we go to see a movie or we watch something on Netflix, um, most of us don't say, um, you know, wow, I've got a story like that. I want to tell my story. You know, I, you know, how can I do that? We usually say things like, wow, the cinematography was amazing, or the plot was really slow, or that could have been shorter, um, or the acting was amazing, whatever, you know, we said things like that. But, um, but so people saw this show and they were like, I have a story like that. I want to tell my story. I have I have videos and, and I have photos. And so the American Film Institute asked Joe and Dana to come there and teach this thing that they were doing. And so they did. And this woman came who um, had enough material to create a documentary about her friend who um, was dying of AIDS. Her friend was a school teacher and and there are other components to the story. But essentially it was a story about somebody else, but already a documentary was being made and um, her story was already being told by, you know, it was on, she was on the Today Show and all these things. And so, and they said, we have three days to do this workshop. So they asked this really vital question and we, we ask it still, is how is this your story? You know, what is the story that only you can tell? And, you know, because, your story about your friend is going to be different than her daughter's story about her or about her as she tells her own story or her mother's story about her. So what is your relationship to the story and what is it that you can tell unique that it's uniquely yours. And so I think she scrapped the original idea. She went home and she drafted a script um, that ended up being the story ended up being a minute and 17 seconds. And it's really powerful. And it's really a story about friendship. Um, and very beautiful. And Joe, after that happened, closed the theater down and started Story Center. We used to be called the Center for Digital Storytelling. And since then, we've been working with groups, as I said, all over the world, all over, certainly in the US, but uh, globally as well. Um, for me, I do a lot of our work in public health, a lot of our work in, our, um, in higher education and edu you know, K through 12 as well, and also most of our international work um, so, you know, what struck Joe, I think, the most is this idea that I've kind of alluded to it already, is that people should be able to tell their own stories, the stories that are uniquely theirs, because, you know, we believe that, um, that everyone has a story, actually everyone has many stories, um, and we don't give people a voice. People already have a voice, but they need the tools to know how to tell a story in, an, in a short, impactful way. And also, if they want to participate in these big conversations that are dominated by all kinds of media, social media and you know, film and television and all of that, then uh, they need the tools to be able to create their own pieces ethically and thoughtfully and creatively so that they can participate in the conversation, not just um, not just consume media. Uh, so we believe that everyone has a story. We, as I said, we believe that people are the experts of their own stories and they should be able to represent themselves um, and their own communities, not have other people tell their stories for them. A lot of people come to our workshops all the time and maybe even some of you um, are thinking about the ways that you wanna use storytelling. They say, oh, I wanna be able to tell other people's stories for them. And so um, I would just encourage you to think about how do we help people tell their own stories. Um, we also believe that listening, being, I'm sorry, listening and being listened to changes us. Uh, again, in this world, people are so busy, we're always looking at our phones um, and not always listening deeply and attentively. And so that's a part of our practice. Our tagline is listen deeply, tell stories. And there's a reason that the listen deeply is first, right? Um, so at Story Center, we help people tell their own stories in their own voices. So first person narratives, I've said that. Uh, we usually work in small groups because there's something really cool that happens in a group when you're being listened to and when you're sharing, you learn something not only about yourself when you tell your story, but also about um, about yourself when you listen to other people's stories. Um, and it's a very participatory and media making practice. People, it's very hands-on. We actually teach the video editing and people learn how to do it themselves. So I've mentioned, and I think we're all believers in this today because we're here, that there is huge power in personal storytelling. 
what I love about stories is that they don't tell us how to think, they don't tell us how to feel, they don't tell us what to do. Stories don't offer advice. Messages are not stories. You know, public service announcements, um, you know, educational videos are not stories necessarily. Statements of belief and opinions are not stories. So what are stories? At least in my opinion, and in every story that I've ever read or heard, something happens to someone or something. Something happens. And like the story that I just told you, the first one about um, working with the tribal leaders in Kenya, stories can change how we relate to each other. They can alter prejudices and stereotypes, which we really need. We've always needed, but now more than ever, we need to tell stories and to listen to each other. And they can help persuade us to empathize with different points of view. Um, I think empathy and listening are two of my favorite uh, superpowers. Um, and so, and if, if think about that, there are all kinds of superpowers, but for me, if I could have two, it would be empathy and listening. Um, so, and Judith mentioned this earlier, um, I'm going to bring it up again because I think it's really important. Um, so many people, when they come to our workshops, they say, you know, but I don't have a big story. I don't have this big journey or something dramatic that happened, a divorce, a deep tragedy. I don't have those things. I just want to tell a story about why I'm a teacher or why I work with refugees or a story about um, what happened when I got cancer or a story about my daughter's adoption. Um, or maybe just a story, um, uh, a small moment about, about how I found a friend, right? Um, and so what we tell people based on our experience and the work that we've been doing for the, all these years is that what's most important, again, is that it's your story and your experience. That you can take a small moment with its unique details and scene, a story again that only you can tell. Because your story of finding courage is different than my story of finding courage. And your story of standing up for racial justice or gender equity is different than your neighbors. At Story Center, we've been working for almost 30 years, helping, like I said, groups all over the world, nonprofits, universities, you know, the you know, UN women's organizations, all kinds of groups. Um, tell their stories, you know, for advocacy, for, um, for education, for community building. And we have developed this curriculum, and we call it the seven steps of digital storytelling. Um, I know that all of the stories that you all may be submitting are not going to be digital, and that's fine. You can submit text stories or audio stories or photo stories, or you may do a video story. Um, but these first three steps or elements of digital storytelling really apply to the story itself and, and crafting your own story and finding um, a way to tell a story in a short, impactful way. The, the stories that we help people make, the digital stories, are usually between 250 and 350 words, which ends up being between two to three and a half minutes. Um, they pack a lot of punch, and you're, it's amazing um, how much you can fit into a short story if you find the right details to tell and the right scenes to tell. So we're gonna talk about owning your insight, owning your emotion, and finding a moment, okay? And kind of the, the, the way that I would explain those a little more clearly is tell, again, when I said, tell a story that only you can tell. Let yourself be vulnerable and honest. I saw a couple of submissions already, and wow, they were really vulnerable, really honest. Um, you know, nobody, we don't like to tell the story when we were the bully or the story when we didn't get the job or the story when we were jealous. Um, but those are the stories that make us human. And if we tell those and we tell how we came to, to recognize that and then the change that we made um, to do something about it or, or what we did with the experience, other people, even if they don't have that same experience, can connect to our experience because they're universal themes. Okay.
So letting yourself be vulnerable and honest and then finding a moment. I'm sure when you were looking at the prompts that I sent, you were thinking, how am I going to tell a moment when I'm thinking about this organization that I've started or this work that I'm doing? But all of, all of that work is made up of many small moments and moments that are representative of the work that you do or the moments that, that really impact you or a person that you're working with. And again, because we can't tell a life journey we can, in these three minute pieces, um, two minute pieces, um, it, finding these moments are what really helps us to, to really find the impact for our stories. Okay. I've found that in the work that we do, a lot of people come with these really big ideas. I'm going to, I'd like to address, you know, I'd like to tell a story about institutional racism in my community, in my small town. And so they come with a really large theme, a, a universal theme. Um, and they think that if, if I tell the big story, um, that more people will be able to connect. But what we found in our work is the more personal it is, the more unique it is to you, the more it's the story that only you can tell, the story that you experienced of racial injustice in your community or that you witnessed or that you helped stand up against is the story that more people can connect with because it creates a sense of intimacy and there's that honesty and it's, it's a story. Again, it's not a message. You're not telling people what to do or to think or to feel. You're just saying, this is what happened to me and here's what I did with it. So I'm gonna show a story from a workshop with international students that came to the US for a year long program. It was funded by the US Department of State. I used to work with this program. And then um, toward the end of the experience for the students, um, they were, at, you know, they were invited to, to create a digital story to go through a workshop with me and um, to tell a story about, you know, they couldn't tell us the whole story of the whole year, but they were to tell a story about something in that year that really impacted them or changed them. And so we'll just talk about it in, in light of story structure that we've just been talking about, about what is the insight to the story? What is the moment or moments? And, and what are the emotions or the vulnerability in the story? I was tired, but excited to meet my host family. I recognized her face before I saw the sign with my name on it. We talked on the drive to her house. She asked about my journey. I learned this was her first time to host girls. How is it to have strangers in your house each year? How can you trust us? I asked. I read your bio and you must be special if you were selected to come here. She asked about my family and how they felt about me being here. I told her about my mom passing away six years ago, how my father was dealing with his depression after losing her, and how my sister and I started working at an early age since my dad lost his job because of his drinking problem. Despite all of this, my family was beyond happy to see me in this program. I was surprised that I had poured out so much of myself in the first 30 minutes of meeting her. Something about her trusting me from just reading my bio made me want to trust her too. My host dad waited by the door and welcomed me with open arms. We continued our conversation over dinner. He also listened like he was really interested in me. Then it was time to shower and go to bed. I had already undressed when I realized I had forgotten a towel. I stood in the bathroom trying to decide what to do. I'm really modest. I was hesitant to call out to her, but the bigger issue was, what should I call her? I stood there for what seemed like a long time. Finally, I called out. Mom, hoping she could hear me down the long hallway. I was amazed at what I had just said. I hadn't used that word for a long time. My host mom came immediately asking what I needed. That's exactly what my mom would have done. I'm just going to talk a little bit about why I, I, I showed this story. I would say it was a pretty big story, but it was told about a small moment. I teach tons of workshops. I show it in every workshop, no matter the age, no matter where in the world they're from because everybody can relate to it. And I think I love its simplicity and I've seen it probably a thousand times and I get teary pretty much every time. Um, 
So a couple of things, just in light of what the story is about, the inside of the story, you know, the story that only Rivati could tell. I think it's a story about surprising yourself. You know, a story about coming to a new country, thinking that, you, you know, you're going to be with strangers, everything's going to be new. And, um, you know, I'm sure you'll have a great time. But, you know, like in this moment, in this really small moment of her standing in the bathroom, very vulnerable without a towel in a stranger's home in a new country, probably super jet lagged, um, having this moment without a towel and that kind of moment of embarrassment and like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? And, and, and yet it's really not about, I mean, that's the moment, the vehicle that she uses to tell the big story, which, you know, the, the big thing was, what do I call her? And then this word comes out of her mouth, mom, and she surprises even herself. Oh my gosh, where did that come from? And what the insight for me, so it's the surprise and it's also, oh, that must mean I really connected to this stranger. That must mean, surprise, surprise, I've, I feel like I found a new family in a way or a, new, a mom, not to replace my mom, but somebody that I can, um, can I can trust like a mom. Right. And so she uses this moment to tell this big idea. So the, probably the question that we, you know, we talked about was, you know, when did you, you know, tell something that impacted you in this year? And she's, oh, you know, I want to tell a story about, you know, how much I love my host family, how, how good they were to me, how they made my year wonderful and how they, you know, helped me connect and, and, and all of that. And so that's like a kind of big, vague idea. And so I was like, well, when did you know? When did you know that that, that that host family relationship mattered to you? And she said, oh, I can tell you the moment. It's this silly little moment, standing in the bathroom <laughs> without a towel. And, and then this, you know, the word mom comes out of my mouth. And so she has a wonderful moment, a couple of moments. She gives us context in another moment, in the moment in the car, right? She gives us a little context about why this word matters so much, about why using the word mom matters. If we don't understand that she's lost her mom and all of the trials that she's gone through, um, we don't understand as a storyteller, we can't go on that journey with her, that story arc of wanting something, even if you don't know what it is that you want, and then finding it. Sometimes we find the thing and then we realize what we were looking for. Every story, every character in every story wants something. In every story you'll find, every film, they want something, whether it's an education, whether it's a friend, whether it's hope, whether it's power, whether it's to not be afraid. And as story listeners, as compassionate human beings, it's why, it's why when we watch the Olympics and they tell the story about um, you know, some sport that you've never heard of and from some small country and they give the human story behind it and then we find ourselves learning about that sport and learning about that country and rooting for that person and that's the person we want to win because we are connected and we're empathizing with their story because we understand this, you know, what they wanted and how they got there and we're rooting for them to get there. So finding those moments, finding that insight, you know, she covers a lot of ground in that first part. You know, my dad lost his job, he was drinking, my mother passed away, I had to start working. But it's not, you know, we don't need much more than that. We just need a little bit of context. And then, she, But here's the thing I really want to tell is this, this moment, this moment when something changed for me, right? Telling is kind of the first version of the story that I told you that she wrote, which is something like, you know, when I came to America or studying abroad can change your life. And there's so many new opportunities and new experiences, new foods, new tastes, new people, cultural differences. But when, and when I came to, the, came to America, all of these things, you know, transformed my experience and had this great, you know, blah, 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 all of those things. But what she did was in that moment, the way that she showed how she just opened up and was talking to her host mom. She used dialogue, she used details about the drive, what happened, you know, what her host father said. Um, and then these small details about, you know, standing there feeling embarrassed and then calling out. So the more you can think about these moments and land in the scene and, and give some of, you know, some of your sensory details, the more you're, instead of telling the storyteller how transformative it, or the listener how transformative it was the experience or the change that's happening in the work that you're doing, you're showing them, you're letting them go on the bike ride with you rather than hearing about how awesome it is to ride bikes. So I'm going to go back 
I have this information here that you'll get when I share with you my PowerPoint. So I'm not gonna really go over it again, but I think we've talked about, you know, owning your insight is really asking what's the experience that, that you wanna share and the experience that only you can tell. If you've got, you know, 10 people from your organization here, you could all tell the, the organizational story, which is great, but I'm guessing you already have that. You have that on your website, you have it in your promotional material, you have it in your PowerPoints. But what's, what really hooks people is the story, you know, that Judith can tell and that Virginia can tell and that Holly can tell. You know, those are the stories, uh, you know, of, of girl rising, of, of, of a conversation with a, a young woman they've worked with or in some kind of educational programs that when they just watch somebody have that aha moment and education, you know, opened up their world. Those are the stories of the organization that are told from a first person personal experience and those are the stories that we remember those are the stories that hook us not the big organizational messaging story so again what is the insight what's the story only you can tell the emotions i think we're pretty clear on that i usually encourage people not to put the emotion words in their story maybe to write it out and think about you know that, that you felt oh i felt so proud or i felt so um, nervous but then instead of saying that show it what did that what does your nervousness look like does your foot tap on the floor do you chew on the end of your pencil while you're thinking about the, the paper that you've got to write for school right so being able to show those emotions rather than to tell them or name them and then finding the moment i'm, I'm hammering that home really hard because especially because you're trying to tell some smaller big stories and small and small um format. So let's watch another story. This one is from South Africa from a project called Grassroots Soccer. I don't know if anybody here today is um, from that organization. They do some really great work. We've worked with them several times. They work with girls of, and, and using sports um, and, and educate. So a lot of girls who may drop out of school otherwise. Um, so they uh, use sports and tutoring um, to help those girls to be able to be successful in school and, and continue through. So yeah, we'll talk about, again, thinking about this story in light of some of the, the things that we've been talking about. Being a girl that loves soccer amongst the boys turned me into a boy to protect what I wanted to be and what I wanted to have. So let me take you back. When I was 13 years old, there were no girls soccer team. So I joined boys team. Boys. You know what it means to being a girl amongst the boys? It's either you follow, you get beat up, or you lead. So I was a leader, but a bad one. I would do anything in my power to get them to listen to me. I was a good fighter. All my friends were boys, and I wouldn't let them beat me up. I always won. This was the only way I could survive. Then it happened. We didn't have the bibs, so coach asked the half of us to take off our t-shirts during practice. That way we could play as shirts against skins. I ordered, if you are on my team, we are not taking off our shirts. I didn't want them to see my breast. They were starting to grow. I couldn't go against my coach. I was so embarrassed. I couldn't believe it when no one seemed to notice that I was a girl. Somehow, my teammates didn't realize until the day they saw me wearing my school uniform. They were shocked to see me in the skate, but they didn't say anything in my face. They were scared of me. I think Coach knew I was a girl, but because I was good, he didn't say anything. As I got better, I was asked to play on the older team. My new teammates knew right away, and they started ganging up on me. From that time, Coach decided to make a girls team. Finally, I felt safe. It was much easier playing with girls. I didn't have to protect myself. I didn't have to hide anything. The other girls even looked up to me as a leader and made me a captain. Now I coach soccer for girls. I tell my team all the time, you shouldn't have to be a bully to do what you love. I'm helping the girls to believe in themselves 
and to be proud of being girls. I'm now the mentor I wish I had. I would say that this is an organizational story told from a first person perspective. You know, why, um, why I do the work that I do, you know, how I learned from my own experience and why I'm a coach and a mentor. Right? She was really honest. You know, she told the story about being the bully, you know, like I wasn't always so nice. You know? um, but then this is, you know, this is what I did with that and turned it into something to help other girls like me. Um, so, you know, a couple of moments in her story, you know, it doesn't have to be one moment. Sometimes it's, it's how the moments transition. You show like how you were before and how you were after. That's one story structure. Another thing to think about is stories don't always start at the beginning and end at the end. Sometimes stories start in the middle. Sometimes they start at the end and they go back to the beginning to give context. In some ways, that's what Rivati's story did. She started in the moment, you know, there's not a lot of background information. She doesn't say, you know, all that stuff I said before. She says, I recognized her face when I saw her holding the sign in the airport. That's her first line. She just jumps right into the story. You don't have time for all the explaining and the fluff. Start where it starts, you know, wherever you're going to start in the story, start with the the scene and so she starts really there kind of in the middle and then she goes back and she gives the context of this you know here's all the things that happened to me before and my family and then she comes back to the moment so sometimes stories you know they can move around and there's different ways of doing story arc but yeah she, she has a couple of moments here I think um, you know the, the power of her voice it's very conversational both of these stories they they sound like they're telling a story to a friend. That's the other thing about the kinds of stories that we help people tell um, at Story Center. There are, you know, there's all kinds of ways of telling stories, but we, again, first person stories from lived experience. And so we encourage people, these aren't essays. They're not presentations. They're not, you know, the papers that you have to write for school. Think about how you would tell this in a conversational way to a friend, to your grandmother, to your next door neighbor and use the vocabulary that you would use if you were speaking that way. You know? um, and short sentences work really well in these, not long complex sentences, um, because then we just don't necessarily talk that way. Especially if you're gonna, if you're in, if you decide you're gonna record your voiceover and, and make a video. Um, I think that really matters uh, in the way that you, that you narrate the story. We have, some writing tips sometimes when people are feeling stuck when they're feeling the, the blank page in front of them and they don't know where to start and so <laughs> so i recommend uh to do this and um we're, we're going to do it all together in just a second um, but it's called the four c's um and so that's an easy way to remember it but the first one is connect and that's just kind of what i was just describing like for example in Rivati's story where she says you know, I recognized her face from the picture when I saw her at the airport. So connect, just jump into the story. It's kind of like for in, in people who are journalists or who are writers, it's like the hook. How are you going to hook people in with that first sentence without giving away where you're going, right? Without explaining up front what you're going to tell, what you're going to talk about. Just tell it. Don't explain what you're going to tell. So very different than at least the way in the U.S. we learn to write. We, we say, here's, you know, our first paragraph is, here's what, my, here's what I'm going to tell. Here's my thesis statement. And here are my three or four or five points that I'm going to make. And then we make all those points. And then in the end, we sum it up. I'm telling you, probably to your teacher's chagrin, do none of that for these kinds of stories. <laughs> Just start in the story, don't tell us what it's about, and then don't sum it up at the end. Don't tell us. It's like explaining the joke after you've told it. If you nail the joke, you do not need to explain it. So connect, context. Go back and give a little bit of information. Give us the kind of the so what, why does this matter? You know, a little bit like, again, what Rivati did. Just that little bit of information about her family and how she got to where she was. And then the change. You know, in a story, something happens. Something changes. You know, uh, we go on a journey and we come back different. Or a stranger comes to town and um, we're no longer the same, right? So, some, you know, so take us through that journey a little bit. And it could be a paragraph or two each. And then final, closure. Get out of the story. Again, don't sum it up. 
just find a place to exit that maybe leaves a question hanging possibly, but leaves enough room for your audience to engage with the story and make sense of it in the way that they need to. We all bring to stories our own experience. And we've all seen movies that, um, you know, it's so predictable. We, they give us too much information. We know where it's gonna go. We can figure it out ahead of time and we check out, we stop listening. We wanna, we wanna keep your audience engaged to the end. Sometimes you do that by creating a little bit of tension, by giving just enough information um, that they don't know where you're going. I'm pretty sure nobody knew in that first story, actually, and in the second one too, but in the first story, that it was she was gonna, it was this thing about her mom, right? We didn't know that that was gonna be the word that popped out of her mouth and that that was gonna be what happened. So she kept us listening until the end. So again, there are no stories that are too small. I think what, we've, what would be good is to, um, if there's a few questions. What approaches do you recommend for revising? And when do you know that you have a finished story? Oh, that's a great, um, that's a great question. I've very rarely found someone who gets, who nails the story in the first draft. Even writers, um, because this process is a little bit different. Um, but the way that what we do is have a little story circle in our process and we share it out loud, like reading it out loud and then getting some feedback um, from peers. So I think that's one approach that people could do is to read it, one, read it out loud and listen to how it sounds and maybe share it with a couple of people and ask questions about, you know, thinking about what your intention was and if you did that. Then I usually go through and help people. Again, I, I'm writing to a specific kind of story. Uh, you know, most of the work that we do, we help you know people turn it into a digital piece. So it's not a written standalone piece. There's often you know visuals or music that go with it. But again, just you know, looking at the sentences and do does everything that's there is it really necessary? It may be beautiful. There's a phrase that, that writers say, you know, so you have to be willing to kill your darlings. So sometimes you may have a beautifully crafted sentence and, and it's really important information to your life and to the, the, the multiplicity of your stories, but it may not really help drive this story. So I, I suggest that people look through the story and make sure that everything is helping to tell the story. If it's superfluous, if it's not needed to help tell the story or to give more grounding or to give more detail, take it out. Um, I also always recommend that you keep your original draft because sometimes you go back and pull things from your first draft. Um, those are a couple of things that I like to do. What else? What advice do you have about the types of photos that make the biggest impact? Uh, that's a good question too. Um, so if you're doing, um, if you're combining, if you're planning to make something like the digital stories that I showed you, and you know, we talk about that a lot more in our in-depth workshop. So you're getting a shorter version just to kind of get a taste of how to, to write. But photos, I think if you're combining them with the narrative, they, you don't want them to be redundant. Um, so if you, you don't need a picture of every noun, for example, in Revati's story, um, in that first part, she used images that create the sense of place or scene. I think that often works really well um, with stories, like some of the ones that you all might be telling. She didn't need a picture of her family, a broken bottle of alcohol, her mother's funeral, you know, all of those things in that first part where she's talking, the narrative, the voice carries the story. In, the, in her piece. And so she used an image that just, that complements it, that creates a sense of scene so we can listen to the story. So they're not competing. So if you're combining them, I would say, you know, look at how, you know, how do they help tell the story? Do they provide more details that you didn't put in the story? Like maybe you have a picture of you and this person that you're talking about, then, then you don't have to describe what they look like. You can show the picture. I'm sure there are some photographers on here. There's a whole lot of thought about how do photos tell stories, but I think, you know, making sure there's not clutter, thinking about um, where, what is the focal point in your photo. Don't always put it in the center. Sometimes leave it off to the side or down, you know, there's this, the rule of thirds in different parts of the frame. So that's a, a tough question to answer in like a minute. So I think that hopefully that gave you some ideas. What else? 
Thank you, Alison. I think we are going to wrap up here. Okay. So thank you so much for such a wonderful conversation. I'm sure we will continue this conversation beyond today. And we will also be setting up a Facebook group as a place to exchange ideas and encourage each other's work. And we hope that all of you will consider submitting your story to the Girl Rising Storytelling Challenge on our website, girlrising.org. We have already had dozens of stories submitted from nearly 30 countries. Stories have the power to create a more equitable and just future. Stories inspire all of us, so tell us your stories and let us amplify your voice. We thank you all for being a part of this webinar today. I just wanted to say thank you all again, um, and I'm really excited to see the stories. If you're interested in learning more about story work or in more in depth or digital storytelling, we have lots of opportunities at Story Center, but I loved being here. Thank you for the opportunity, and I'm excited to, to hear and see and read everybody's stories that you submit. So thank you all. In closing, I would like to join Vicki and Aria in gratitude for all of you for joining us today on this webinar. In particular, we would like to thank HP for this incredible partnership in support of our storytelling challenge. Allison and colleagues at the Story Center, thank you for your partnership today. This has been an incredible journey. I wish you all a wonderful day. I look forward to your stories. The world looks forward to your stories. <laughs>